Good afternoon. I would like to thank Dr. Akilani, Dr. Nshasi, and the organizers of the symposium for inviting me. My topic today is combining anti-seizure medications for rational polytherapy of epilepsy. I will review evidence for combination therapy versus alternative monotherapy. I will review anti-seizure medication mechanisms of action, pharmacodynamic interactions and pharmacokinetic interactions. And I will discuss evidence favoring specific anti-seizure medication combinations. In the 1970s and early 1980s, polytherapy was the rule in the treatment of epilepsy, particularly for drug-resistant patients. A combination of phenobarbital and phenytoin was often the initial treatment. But as additional anti-seizure medications were introduced, combination therapies were associated with unfavorable interactions and toxic adverse effects. And the term polytherapy was introduced with its negative connotations. Uh, several studies reported cognitive benefits of converting patients to monotherapy usually without worsening seizure control, but in general, uh, that didn't make patients seizure free. With the introduction of many new anti-seizure medications, most of which initially approved for adjunctive therapy, the notion uh, of rational polytherapy was introduced. And in comparison with the older drugs, uh, newer anti-seizure medications were less sedating, uh, had improved tolerability profile, and a lower potential for interactions, uh, making them suitable adjunctive agents. And it was also proposed that uh, perhaps it was the total medication load that resulted in poor tolerability, and that if you combine uh, low doses of two anti-seizure medications, uh, there would be better tolerability. Now, monotherapy continues to be the standard for initial therapy. Uh, we have a lot of drugs to choose from. Uh, when we choose the first drug, uh, of course, we have to consider efficacy against the seizure type but additional considerations play a role. And those include comorbidity, the urgency of action, uh, cognitive function, gender, age, communication, et cetera. And of course, we also consider tolerability and safety. But after failure of the first drug, what should we do? Uh, monotherapy, alternative monotherapy, or add-on therapy? This was evaluated in several studies. I will discuss a couple of them. So Kwan and Brody, as part of their uh, landmark uh, study in newly diagnosed uh, and newly treated patients, uh, they looked at 248 patients who failed their first anti-seizure medication. And when the failure was due to lack of efficacy, uh, patients received either substitution or combination uh, therapy. They found uh, similar seizure-free rates and similar uh, side effects, whether it was add-on or substitution. But you can see that the numbers uh, favor add-on uh, therapy. They also found that more patients became seizure-free when the combination involved a sodium channel blocker and a drug with multiple mechanisms of action as compared to other combinations. And uh, their definition of multiple mechanisms included uh, valproate, topiramate, and gabapentin, which we don't consider a drug with multiple mechanisms lately. Interestingly, uh, a combination therapy was much more likely to succeed if it was performed early after the first drug was failed as compared to after uh, a second drug uh, had failed in monotherapy. Uh, Beggy and colleagues reported a multi-center randomized controlled open label trial in patients who had failed a single drug. Patients were randomized to either adjunctive therapy or, or alternative monotherapy uh, 
and the drug choice and dose adjustment were by physician judgment. Uh, they followed patients for 12 months or until withdrawal from allocated treatment. And of 157 patients, uh, 76 randomized to alternative monotherapy and 81 to adjunctive therapy. The 12 month probability of remaining on assigned treatment uh, was similar between the two groups, 55% for alternative monotherapy, 65% for adjunctive therapy. And again, the 12 month probability of remaining seizure free and the adverse effects were similar in the two groups. However, there are scenarios that might favor one approach versus the other. For example, scenarios that favor substitution monotherapy include instances where the first drug was not tolerated, the first drug was totally ineffective. In elderly patients where we avoid multiple medications, women of childbearing potential contemplating pregnancy, patients with compliance challenges, we'd like to keep it simple for them, and patients who have financial limitations where uh, it's harder to afford two drugs versus one. Scenarios that favor add-on therapy include instances where the first drug was well tolerated and partially effective, or the first drug was effective with complete control, but only at a dose that was not well tolerated. So we can lower the dose slightly and then add another medication. If the add-on treatment has not been well-tested monotherapy, uh, I would hesitate to use it as uh, monotherapy. I would prefer to use it as adjunctive therapy. So uh, considerations in choosing the add-on treatment are similar to uh, those in choosing the first drug. Uh, however, there are uh, interactions to take into consideration, pharmacokinetic interactions, and pharmacodynamic interactions, which are related to shared mechanism of action. So these are the main anti-seizure medication mechanisms of action. And the most important are sodium channel blocking and enhancing GABA. So if we look at sodium channel blocking, we have drugs that we consider classical sodium channel blockers, and the list includes Phenytoin, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, eslicarbazepine, lamotogine, and rufinamide. And among selective, uh, sorry, and, and the other mechanism is selective enhancement of slow inactivation, which is the mechanism for lacosamide. And then we have uh, several drugs with multiple mechanisms of action that includes an effect on sodium channels. And the list includes valproate, felbamate, topiramate, vanisamide, and sinobamate. And these drugs don't interact in the same way uh, as uh, the uh, above list of, of drugs. Uh, drugs that enhance GABA include ligabatin, tiagabin, phenobarbital, benzodiazepines, topiramate, valproate, felbamate, sinobamate, cannabidiol. Now, pharmacokinetic interactions are most often related to enzyme induction or inhibition. And uh, enzyme inducers include older drugs, phenobarbital, primidone, phenytoin, carbamazepine. These drugs induced multiple uh, P450 enzymes and increased their metabolism and reduced the levels of drugs that are metabolized by the liver. Some newer uh, drugs are selective enzyme inducers, for example, oxcarbazepine and eslicarbazepine are weak inducers of CYP3F4, which metabolizes estrogen. Enzyme inhibition uh, is seen with valproate, felbamate, sinovamate, and some newer drugs are uh, selective weak inhibitors. For example, oxcarbazepine and topiramate are weak inhibitors of CYP2C19. We can also see interactions via protein binding. Highly protein bound drugs may displace each other from protein binding, resulting in increased protein free fractions. And the protein free fraction is the most clinically relevant for both toxicity and efficacy. 
But interaction by uh, competing for protein binding is relevant only when dosing decisions are made based on total serum concentration. And that's the case for uh, phenytoin and valproate. Now, uh, when we combine drugs, we have to avoid unfavorable interactions. In particular, enzyme inducers make adjunctive anti-seizure medications less effective requiring a higher dose. And some combinations cause increased levels of toxic metabolites. For example, uh, valproate and felmamate increased, increase uh, carbamazepine epoxide. And using valproate with an enzyme inducer uh, results in uh, toxic valproate metabolites. Inhibitors are less of a problem. In fact, they allow lower doses of adjunctive anti-seizure medications. For example, when you add lamotrigine to valproate, you need lower doses of lamotrigine. Pharmacodynamic interactions are related to mechanism of action. So combining two drugs with the same mechanism may cause adverse experiences, even though the levels are in the therapeutic range. And combining two drugs with different mechanisms reduces the chance of adverse pharmacodynamic interactions. Uh, but one question is, do different mechanisms also predict better efficacy? And that was addressed by a study uh, that uh, looked at insurance databases. So adults with concomitant use of two different drugs and recent partial onset seizure diagnosis were studied. The drugs were categorized by mechanism of action. And the authors looked at treatment persistence, which was measured from the start of the combination until the end of the combination. And they also looked at healthcare resource use during the combination uh, treatment. So the study included 8,615 uh, patients. And here are the lists of the most common combinations. And they found that combinations with the same mechanism of action, uh, mainly GABA plus GABA or sodium channel plus sodium channel, had the shortest persistence of treatment and the greatest hazard of discontinuation compared with different mechanism combinations. And they also found that uh, patients with different uh, GABA combinations so GABA plus a different combination, had a lower risk for inpatient admissions compared with GABA plus GABA combination. In patients with different uh, sodium channel combinations, so sodium channel plus a different mechanism, had significantly lower risks for emergency department visits compared with sodium channel plus sodium channel combinations. Are there specific combinations that are synergistic? Animal data support a number of combinations as synergistic, but there's solid uh, human data only for one, which is valproate plus lamotrigine. And this became obvious initially in a monotherapy, uh, convergent monotherapy study of lamotrigine, where patients taking valproate, carbamazepine, or phenytoin, but still having seizures, were recruited for conversion to lamotrigine monotherapy. Now, during the process of substitution, patients were on the combination treatment for a while. And what uh, the authors found is that the addition of lamotrigine to valproate produced a significantly better response than addition of lamotrigine to carbamazepine or phenytoin. So 64% responders versus 41% and 38% for the other two. And the effect was seen for both focal seizures and primary tonic-clonic seizures, even though the numbers were too small for the primary tonic-clonic seizures. Now, uh, this was confirmed in another study uh, of 20 adults with refractory complex partial seizures who were not previously exposed to valproate or lamotrigine. Now, they were scheduled to receive consecutive add-on treatments. First, valproate, 
and for those who don't respond, uh, then lamotrigine, and for those who don't respond to lamotrigine, then the combination of valproate and lamotrigine. So this was an open response conditional crossover design. And each period consisted of a six to 12 week dose optimization, followed by three months evaluation on a stabilized serum drug level. So only patients not responding to one phase proceeded to the next. So three of 20 patients responded to valproate, so that left 17 who were given lamotrigine, and four of those 17 responded to lamotrigine. And of the remaining 13 patients who didn't respond to either valproate or lamotrigine, 61% responded to the combination. So eight out of 13. And in fact, four of them became seizure-free and the other four experienced 62 to 78% seizure reduction. And they asked the question, could this be because of uh, increased levels of lamotrigine? But they actually found that optimized dosages and peak serum levels of both valproate and lamotrigine were lower during the combined therapy than they were during separate administration. So, so this did not explain, and this was a true synergy between the two drugs. Now this was uh, confirmed in a uh, study uh, by Poulos and colleagues uh, in 148 developmentally disabled adults with refractory epilepsy, uh, where uh, very good records were kept of uh, convulsive seizures and anti-seizure medication regimen over 30 years. So the authors looked at the effect of eight commonly used drugs, monotherapy or combinations. And these were the uh, drugs that were most commonly used. Uh, Lamotrigine and Vaporate were, were the top two. Uh, they used data where there was at least four months of exposure to a given combination. And they calculated the average seizure frequency per month during the entire time of exposure. And uh, they made within patient uh, comparisons of efficacy using ratios of seizure frequency uh, to all other combinations or to a specific combination. So what they found is that Dual therapy provided better efficacy than monotherapy, but combinations of three drugs had no advantage over two drugs. And the combination of lamotrigine and valproate provided better efficacy than any other combination, particularly in patients with focal platform abnormalities. And this was not explained by pharmacokinetic interaction. So the, the level, the elevated levels did not explain uh, that uh, superiority. Are there other combinations with evidence of synergism? Uh, data is very limited, really. There is weak data supporting valproate and ethosuximide combination in patients who are resistant uh, to valproate or to ethosuximide. And uh, in another study looking at response to levetiracetam, uh, patients who uh, became seizure-free, more often took the combination of vetorastam and lamotrigine than patients who were not uh, responders. How about uh, lacosamide? Uh, this is a very nice uh, study that uh, it's a post hoc analysis of pooled clinical uh, data, looking at the mechanism of action of adjunctive medications. So uh, either sodium channel uh, drug or no sodium channel drug in the concomitant medications. The majority, 82%, were using at least one concomitant uh, traditional sodium channel blocking medication, including carbamazepine, lamotrigine, oxcarbazepine, or phenytoin. And what uh, the authors found is that efficacy was more pronounced and adverse experiences were less frequent in the subgroup without traditional sodium channel blocking and to seizure medication. 
So uh, I incorporated this from uh, the paper. On the left, you see the traditional sodium, ch traditional sodium channel blocking drugs. And on the right, the group without uh, sodium channel blocking drug. And you can see uh, that efficacy was a lot better at 600 milligrams per day, 42.4% uh, were responders in, in, the, in that group on the left compared to 79.2% in the group without sodium channel blocking drugs. And if you look at dizziness as, as, as an adverse experience, almost 60% of patients uh, had dizziness at 600 milligrams per day compared to less than 30 uh, in the patients uh, not using a, a sodium channel drug as an adjunctive agent. How about uh, with Esli Carbazepine? Uh, Piton and colleagues found that uh, patients taking concomitant carbamazepine had less marked improvement in efficacy outcomes and also had a higher rate of adverse effects of dizziness, diplopia, vomiting, and nausea. And you can see here uh, in, in the lighter uh, green, uh, no carbamazepine, and then dark green, plus carbamazepine, carbamazepine. You see that dizziness, diplopia, vomiting, nausea were all increased when carbamazepine was used adjunctively. So this is not a good combination. I looked at the combination of estlicarbazepine uh, with lamotrigine, again, in, in pooled uh, study data. And the overall placebo-adjusted incidence of adverse effects was higher in the lamotrigine group, 16% versus 10%. Uh, but the effect was less than uh, seen with carbamazepine. So combining Eslicarbazepine with lamotrigine uh, is expected to produce more adverse effects than with a non-sodium channel blocking drug, but it's not as bad as with carbamazepine. So some specific adverse effects had a higher incidence uh, in the 1200 milligram group, uh, dizziness, diplopia, and vertigo, but because the numbers were small, it didn't reach significance. And here you see, the stars show the, uh, you know, at 1200 milligrams per day that uh, dizziness, uh, diplopia, and vertigo were higher when lamotrigine and eslicarbazepine was com were uh, compared, uh, were combined as compared to eslicarbazepine with, without a sodium channel blocking drug on the left side. How about parampinal combinations? This was evaluated by Juan and colleagues in data pooled from three different phase three trials. And concomitant drugs were categorized as to whether they are enzyme inducing as, and as to whether they block sodium channel. And it turns out that there was no effect of the mechanism of action as long as the drug was not enzyme inducing. Uh, but uh, when parampinol was combined with an enzyme-inducing drug, uh, efficacy was reduced. And uh, you can see here uh, on top is uh, no enzyme-inducing drug, and at the bottom is the presence of at least one enzyme-inducing drug. You see that uh, the, the reduction in seizure frequency and the responder rate are uh, lower in the presence of an enzyme-inducing drug. How about uh, brivacetam combinations? Uh, if you combine brivacetam with carbamazepine, uh, there is a doubling of uh, carbamazepine epoxide concentration, and that is responsible for a lot of adverse effects. Uh, this is a dose-dependent inhibition of epoxide hydrolase. Another important uh, point is that uh, rivastam is not effective if combined with lipetrastam. So uh, we should not add uh, these two drugs together. <clears throat> 
Uh, one study looked at combination of reverse time with lamotrigine versus topiramate, and there, were, there was no clear difference in efficacy between these combinations. Now, uh, this is an interesting uh, combination, cannabidiol and clobazam. Uh, cannabidiol can inhibit CYP2C19, which metabolizes the active metabolite of clobazam, that's n desmethyl clobazam. And uh, both the, the active metabolites of both drugs are increased when the two are combined. And you can see that there's evidence that efficacy of cannabidiol is greater in patients uh, taking clobazam at baseline. So almost a double uh, uh, responder rate. Uh, in a meta-analysis, again, the responder rate was higher in patients who were taking clobazam at baseline. Uh, but uh, cannabidiol, cannabidiol does have uh, independent efficacy, uh, even in the absence of, of clobazam. Uh, now, uh, patients taking the combination of cannabidiol and clobazam had a greater incidence of sedation, and they usually required reduction in the dose of uh, clobazam as a result of sedation. So Novamate is one of the latest medications to be marketed in the US. It is an inhibitor of sub 2 19 and that increases levels of phenobarbital and phenytoin, but also levels of n clobazam, the active metabolite of clobazam. And uh, in a study that uh, we did at uh, Vanderbilt, uh, you know, this was part of a multi-center uh, phase three trial of uh, the tolerability of uh, sinobomate. Uh, we had six patients who took clobazam at baseline at 20 to 50 milligrams. Uh, sedation uh, began at uh, sinobomate doses of uh, 25 to 100 milligrams uh, uh, per day. Uh, we stopped clobazam in all these patients because of excessive sedation. But when we did, we lost efficacy. So in the month before we stopped clobazam, five patients were responders. Three had more than 75% seizure reduction and two were seizure free. But two months after stopping clobazam, only one patient still was a responder. So we restarted clobazam at five milligrams per day in five of the six patients. And in the month after restarting Clobazam, uh, two were responders and one was seizure-free. And then last follow-up, four were responders. So two were seizure-free and two were, had more than 50% responder rate. So we started using the strategy in other patients who were not on Clobazam. So we had five other patients who had not responded to Sinobamate. We added five milligrams per day of Clobazam. And uh, two uh, of these patients had greater than 50% reduction and one became seizure free, but uh, two uh, stopped clobazam due to adverse effects. And you can see here that uh, the ratio of clobazam of, of the metabolite to the parent drug increases considerably as the dose of sinobamate increases. So this is at 100 milligrams of sinobamate. Us usually the ratio is about uh, 10, so at 100 milligrams, it increased to 15 or 18. At 150, it was 75. At 200, it was up to 126 in the patient. So in conclusion, irrational polytherapy may exist. So combining two sodium channel blockers, for example, combining an enzyme inducer with a drug that is metabolized by the liver, reducing the efficacy of the other drug. Rational anti-seizure medication combinations should avoid adverse pharmacokinetic interactions. We should avoid three drug combinations if possible. We should try to include different mechanisms of action when we combine two drugs. And we should definitely avoid combining two sodium channel blockers, or classical blockers or 
lacosamide plus a classical blocker, mainly because of toxicity. But also efficacy is not as good as we, when we combine a sodium channel blocker with a non-blocker. Uh, there is limited evidence favoring specific anti-seizure combinations, uh, except for lamotrigine and vaporweed, where the evidence is very strong. And in the future, better understanding of epilepsy pathophysiology and anti-seizure mechanisms of action will help refine the science of anti-seizure medication and rational polytherapy. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>